Welcome to our service today. Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. That's where we are today. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. And come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. Now that's from Psalms 96, and it's a prophetic scripture that when he comes, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. So let's praise the Lord Let's lift his name today. Let's put all other thoughts aside and let's give him the honor that is due him. We have a couple announcements today. Cindy's coming. Good morning. Um, I don't know, a lot of you maybe haven't heard, but there are several of us that are planning to go to the processing center in Charlotte on Friday and Saturday before Memorial Day. And um, we had put in to bring like six people, and we've had a couple people that had to cancel at the last minute. So we have a couple openings if anybody's interested. What we're going to be doing is uh, they've always had this thing where you could pack boxes online if you were the type of person that couldn't get out or didn't want to go shopping. You could pack boxes online. Well, with the way this past year has been, they've had thousands of boxes packed online. So they need people to come and actually pack the boxes. Hmm. So they have all these, all these items that need to be put in boxes so they can be sent out to the kids, thousands of them. So we're going down for a couple days to pack boxes. So if there's anybody that's interested, if, um, we'll be leaving early Friday morning and we'll get back super late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. We're just going to make a quick trip of it and we're going to work like six or seven hours each day. So if you're interested, please see me. Very good. I'd like to announce to you that Cindy's son, Jordan, is married now, and uh, he married a young woman who's a lawyer. Now, Jordan was an excellent student at Ohio State. He, he got top honors in, in engineering, and so this young man's working for Exxon, Exxon Oil Company, and he's in Colorado. Is that right, Cindy? Say again? Texas. He's in Texas. Okay, so did you go to Texas for the... No, they were married in Columbus. Oh, they went to Columbus because other people knew them there. Well, her family's from all over, but he, he just happened to be one family in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. We, uh, as you remember, uh, Jordan had a girlfriend uh, years ago uh, at Logan High School who was the valedictorian of Logan High School. Her name again? Yes, Lauren Cassidy. They were hit broadside by a car that came up over the hill, and Lauren was rushed to Logan Hospital in the emergency room. When I went there, there must have been as many as 40 people standing in the corridors waiting for word about what the result would be of her life. I really didn't know what to do. I went and prayed with the mother. I prayed with the father. I prayed with the brothers and sisters. I even had one of the brothers come here two weeks later because he was so 
forlorn after the death of his sister, and uh, he accepted Christ. He was a teacher at Logan High School. So good came from it. She died there, of course, in the emergency room that night. And uh, Jordan, as you can imagine, uh, was in tremendous grief for a long time. So this is a turn of events to see him marry a young woman he fell in love with, so we're happy for him. And then we have a, another announcement. Go ahead, dear. You're on. Hi. Oh, gosh, I feel like I'm really yelling at you. Um, we had our first Girls for God meeting, and we had four girls, which was really great. Um, we had a really good time. We cooked, and we played games. And, but we're going to have our second meeting on Monday um, from 6 to 7.30. Over here. <laughs> and um, I've gotten some calls from other people that go to other churches wanting to see if they could bring their kids. So we'll have three from a different church come this week. So I'm just really excited. It's been really, really fun. And Alice came, and we made her pizza. <laughs> so it was really fun. And if um, anybody in the back row would like to come, they're welcome to come. So just, just let me know, and we'll just have fun and fellowship. And yeah, so thanks. I'm happy for you. I'm excited for you, too, Jackie. I think it's great. Uh, Jackie's an evangelist, you can tell. She points people out right in the congregation that should be there. <laughs> Our opening song, um, Skip is here, I believe, to lead us, is he? Yes. So let's all stand, shall we? Good morning. Before we start this, I had a uh, something to read here. Thought it was interesting. Like I said a couple weeks ago, it's kind of celebration of Memorial Day and all the people that served and all the people that died in, in uh, our country. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, this is kind of out of context, but this is by a past chaplain of the U.S. Senate. His name's Peter Marshall. And he said, Lord Jesus, we ask, one of the prayers he'd start the sessions with, Lord Jesus, we ask thee to guide the people of this nation as they exercise their dearly bought, dearly bought privilege of franchise. May it neither be ignored unthinkingly nor undertaken lightly. As citizens all over this land go to the ballot boxes, give them a new sense or give them a sense of high privilege and joyous responsibility. Help those who are about to be elected to public office to come to understand the real source of their mandate, a mandate given by no party machine, received at no polling booth, but given by God, a mandate to represent God and truth at the heart of the nation, a mandate to do good in the name of him under whom this country was established. We ask thee to lead our country in the paths where thou wouldst have her walk, to do the tasks which thou hast laid before her, so may we together seek happiness for all citizens in the name of him who created us all equal in his sight, and therefore brothers. Amen. That was by Peter Marshall. And now you're already standing, so let's sing the uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. He is tramping out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful light. Glory, glory, I 
Now, if you guys put that back up, I want the ladies to sing the last, last verse there. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hello. Hello back there. One more, please. There you go, ladies. That's your, that's your part right there. I want you to sing it for me. a quick poll to take. How many of the uh, of you want to stop wearing these? Thank you. Have a seat, it's folks. June 2nd here. Hmm? It's June 2nd. June 2nd? Father, we thank you today that we can lift your name on high and say glory, glory, hallelujah, because we know that the battle that we fight in this world is not going to be solved by the government or any group of people, but it's going to be resolved because you have invested the Holy Spirit in the people that sit in these pews and in the pulpits of America where the word of God goes out on a Sunday by Sunday basis where people come to the very center of their lives because it's the hub of the wheel. The church is the hub and the spokes of the wheel are all the activities that take place that come from people's lives. And so we pray that we would put a guard on our hearts, a guard upon our lips, a guard upon our eyes, a guard upon our ears. We're the ones that control this body and you have commanded us to be people who know what to listen to, what to see, what to think. And so God, help us to take every thought that enters our mind and put it under the captivity of Jesus Christ so that he can control this person that is here today. God, we know how weak we are, how things enter in through the eye gate and the ear gate. These things take place in the mind. The thoughts then are are exacerbated and suddenly they start thinking the wrong way and then the actions come externally because all actions come from thought and so we ask you that you would be the caretaker of our thoughts not only the caretaker but also the controller so we ask for these people today a tremendous blessing for having come here may they go away understanding the word of God in such a way that they would live it and as a result of living it their life will be totally blessed the joy will be abounding, and their lives will change for the better. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said? Amen. 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 Celebration in song. Skip's coming again. Well, actually, it is supposed to be The Battle Belongs to the Lord, Master Chorus Book 2, number 71. In heavenly we'll enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. We sing honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing Glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. When 
the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood, the battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. That's an amen. Thank you. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. And uh, we're going to stand and read the scripture in honor of God's word today, okay? So stand with me as we read this scripture, Matthew 5, 27 through 30. Children can go at this time, yes. Thanks for coming today, kids, and bringing your parents. <laughs> there goes Ella, Ella and Elliot, curly head little boy. <laughs> All right, read with me. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Father, we thank you today that there are specific instructions about the kind of sexual attitude that we have. We're all sexual beings or else we wouldn't be here. And so we ask God that we would have the right attitude about this and that we would guard our hearts because in the heart first takes place adultery. And so we ask you, God, to help us who are weak individuals, uh, who are bound with uh, sexual desire, and we pray that these desires might be focused in the right way. So we ask you to bless this congregation in the hearing of your word today in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. It's happened so many times that it's hard to count. People today who get married, it seems, are taking vows before God. However, they don't mean it. The majority don't mean it. At least 45% don't mean it. That's the divorce rate in this country. By the way, we have the highest divorce rate of any industrialized country in the world in America. So something's wrong at the very root of people's lives in this country because marriage is meant to be sacred. It's supposed to be a vow taken before God. However, when young couples stand before me, they're such in a hurry to get out of here that I wonder if they understand what they've said. A couple gets married, and before long they buy a house, and they work in the late hours to fix up the place. Then they have children, and they watch them grow. And then, together, they support each other through many challenging and difficult times. Soulmates they're supposed to be, Lovers, partners in this life forever till death do us part. Then one day he has an affair with another woman. 
She too was happily married, by the way. She loved her husband with her whole heart, at least she did. There's an old joke about the seventh commandment, do not commit adultery. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and announces, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I got him down to 10. The bad news is that adultery stays. The joke is telling. The prohibition on a married person having sexual relations with anyone except his or her spouse may be for many people the most consistently difficult of the Ten Commandments to observe. The reasons shouldn't be hard to guess. One is the enormous power of the sex drive. It can be very hard to keep in check for the entirety of one's marriage, especially when an attractive outsider makes him or herself sexually or romantically available. Another reason is the human desire to love and be loved. For normal people, there is no more powerful emotion than love. If one falls in love with someone while married, it takes great effort not to commit adultery with that person. And if we add in the unfortunate circumstance of a loveless marriage, adultery becomes even more difficult to resist. That's why the joke with which I began is funny, because it reflects truth. Why is adultery prohibited in the Ten Commandments? Because, like the other nine, it is indispensable to forming and maintaining higher civilization. Adultery threatens the very building block of the civilization that the Ten Commandments seeks to create. That building block is the family, a married father and mother and their children. Anything that threatens the family unit is prohibited in the Bible. Adultery is one example. Not honoring one's father and mother is another. And the prohibition on injecting any sexuality into the family unit, incest, is a third example. Why is the family so important? Because without it, social stability is impossible. Because without it, the passing on of society's values from generation to generation is impossible. Because commitment to a wife and children makes men more responsible and mature. Because more than anything else, family meets most women's deepest emotional and material needs. And nothing comes close to the family in giving children a secure and stable childhood. And why does adultery threaten the family? The most obvious reason is that sex with someone other than one spouse can all too easily lead to either or both spouses leaving the marriage. Adultery should not automatically lead to divorce, but it often does. There is another reason adultery can destroy a family. It can lead to pregnancy and then to the birth of a child. That child will, in almost all cases, start out life with no family, meaning no father and mother married to each other to call his or her own. And if adultery doesn't destroy a family, it almost always does terrible harm to a marriage. Aside from the sense of betrayal and loss of trust that it causes, it means that the adulterous partner lives a fraudulent life. When a husband or wife is having sex with someone other than their spouse, their thoughts are constantly about that other person and about how to deceive their spouse. The life of deception that an adulterous affair necessarily entails inevitably damages a marriage, even if the betrayed spouse is unaware of the affair. Finally, the commandment prohibiting adultery doesn't come with an asterisk saying that adultery is okay if both spouses agree to it. Spouses who have extramarital sex with the permission of their husband or wife yeah. may not necessarily be hurting their spouse's feelings, but they are still harming the institution of marriage. And protecting the family, not protecting spouses from emotional pain, is the reason for the commandment. Many marriages, sadly, are troubled. And it is not for any of us to stand in judgment of others' behavior in this realm. No one knows what goes on in anyone else's marriage. And if we did, we might often well understand why one or the other sought love outside the marriage. Wow. 
but no higher civilization can be made or can endure that condones adultery. That is why it is prohibited in the Ten Commandments. I'm Dennis Prager. Join Prager University, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for free at PragerU.com. It's not amazing that men and women get involved in sexual sin. It's not amazing. What is amazing is how much people are willing to pay to commit adultery. Long-standing relationships of love and trust are shattered. Kids lose their parents and are scarred by sorrow and guilt and it lasts a lifetime for many. People surrender their careers, their reputations, their homes, their savings, their friends, and their relationship with God. All in the pursuit of happiness, happiness that vanishes and turns out to be a mere mirage. Today, it's a situation that airs on primetime television. Television refers to adultery, to sex outside of marriage, 13 times more than it ever refers to intimacy in a marriage. We live in a visual world. I thought this visual was interesting because it makes the point at the top, our brain processes visuals 60,000 times faster than text material. 90% of the information transmitted to the brain is visual. You say, that's right. The knowledge I picked up was from my eyes that I read a book or it was from seeing something that was broke down around the house so I have to fix it all taken place because of the eye gate, the eye gate. It's called the eye gate because it goes directly to the soul, what you see. Seventy percent of your sensory receptors are in your eyes. Sensory means emotions. Chemical reactions of the brain can take place just by sight, seventy percent. 50% of your brain is active in visual processing. Half the brain works with the eyes. 40% of people respond better to visuals. I know that as a teacher. That's why I use this thing. Because you're more likely to remember the pictures than what I say. Because it processes so quickly in the brain. Marketing on TV, in the newspapers, in magazines, even on the radio, everything is advertised by sex. The old saying, sex sells, is really true, and the advertisers know that. Whether it's ice cream or a 4x4 four four greasy Jeep, they all sell with sex. All the programming that you see on television is decided by writers and marketers who sit around a table somewhere and try to write out how this advertising will be displayed. These people are trained in the art of advertising. I took an advertising course at Ohio University. I know what's in the book. Their desire is to change wants into needs so that you feel, I gotta have this more than anything else. So they are trained in behavioral psychology and this training leads them to understand how people think and so when you see the ads on TV for testosterone for instance that so testosterone boosters that are sold at Walmart you see at the end of that slide very quickly a man having sex with a woman have you seen it sure So we're not beyond that, even in full-scale prime television. We see these things being marketed all the time. They understand that the greatest passion people have is sexual passion. And as a result, they're going to play to that as often as they can. 
it'll catch your attention. We live in an environment of voyeurism. Voyeurism simply means that people get turned on, they get satisfaction by watching others engaged in sexual activity. That's why pornography is such a high seller, especially among men and women, because just looking at it, people have a vicarious experience. All this sexual heat has affected Christian believers. 50% of conservative evangelical Christians believe that sex does not have to be restricted to marriage. That's people like you that sit in the pew of conservative churches. They believe you don't have to restrict sex to marriage anymore. It's no wonder with all the advertising and, and billboards and all the other things that are transferred through movies and, the, and songs that people feel that way. One out of every two Christians believe that sex can either be a part of a loving relationship or it doesn't have to be a part of love at all. It's just meant for self-satisfaction. Not only does Jesus disagree with these prevailing attitudes about sex, but also Jesus makes sexual sin a deeper problem than people realize. We t he tells us to avoid fatal attractions. Matthew 5.27, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. The word adultery technically refers to having sexual relations with a person who is not your spouse, technically. Actually, it is a word that forbids all kinds of sexual relations outside of marriage, between a man and a woman. We used to say that having sex outside of marriage is called fornication. It still is, but it's also called adultery. So it has more meaning than people believe. Paul lists practically every type of sexual sin in this scripture. Or do you know, do you not know, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. What a mouthful. Scripture is clear. Any sex outside of marriage for any reason is a sin. You wouldn't think so, would you? One form of adultery that has become widely accepted is cohabitation. It's what people used to call living in sin. I don't hear that much anymore. As one grandmother said to her granddaughter, remember... He's never going to buy the cow if he can get the milk free. Should couples live together before marriage? That's what we're going to talk about today on The Beat. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. My name is Alan Parr. And so we know that living together before marriage, or what I call slick shacking, is becoming more and more popular as our society is becoming more and more skeptical of the institution of marriage. And so as a result, it's led many people, including relationship experts, to believe that living together before marriage provides the couple an opportunity to try it before you buy it or test drive the car. But the question is, does this really work? Interestingly, the statistics actually prove otherwise. Dozens of secular studies were performed and thousands of couples were carefully observed and they all consistently report 
the same thing. One study showed that couples who live together have a 46% higher likelihood of getting a divorce when compared to those that don't. Another study showed that over 60% of couples who live together before marriage will actually not even make it to marriage, but of the 40% that actually do get married, five out of six of them will be divorced within three years. And they also show a higher level of adultery and, across the board, a lower level of sexual satisfaction in the marriage. But the real question that we must ask is why? Why are these statistics so outrageously high when it makes so much logical sense for a couple to live together before marriage? One of the reasons is because oftentimes men view living together as a convenient way to have sex and also a way to test drive the relationship before they make a lifelong commitment. Whereas women tend to see living together as the next step before marriage. And so what ends up happening is this couple makes a financial, emotional investment, and the investment is so big that the longer they stay in the relationship, the more difficult it is for them to get out of the relationship. And so what ends up happening is they end up sliding, not deciding, into marriage. A second reason is that oftentimes people who choose to live together before marriage tend to have less conservative views about the biblical institution of marriage. And so when things get difficult, when troubles come, they may be more prone to bail on the relationship as opposed to sticking to the covenant that they made before God. Finally, living together before marriage can create a mentality that says, I've got a back door, I've got an exit plan strategy if I need, or if I become discontent at any time with this contractual agreement that we have set up, I can throw up the deuces and say, peace, you go your way, I go mine. And if not careful, that same mentality will follow that couple into their marriage relationship. Finally, what does the Bible have to say, if anything at all, about this topic of living together before marriage or shacking up? Well, interestingly enough, the Bible doesn't have a specific scripture that says it's a sin, but like many other things, there are principles that we should apply that will help guide our decision. First of all, the Bible says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And so whenever we see couples living together before marriage, we as Christians should not allow our minds to be influenced by what the world is doing. Instead, we should be influenced by what the Word of God says. Second of all, the Bible says that we should not put ourselves in sexually tempting situations. It says, flee or run from immorality. Third of all, it says that we should not just avoid evil, but it says we should avoid the very appearance of evil. And so let's say you're living together and you're not having sex. For all intents and purposes, people looking on the outside are going to assume that you are. Which leads me to my final reason why I believe that it is not a good idea for Christians to live together. Because when we do, we are sending a message to the world that basically says sex before marriage is okay, living together before marriage is okay, and those that may be looking up to you may follow your behavior, and as a result of your decision, you may actually be causing them to stumble into sin. So I know this video was really controversial. There's so many different views on this subject, and so I would love to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Also, if you found it helpful, please share it with a friend. If you haven't done so already, head over to my YouTube channel and subscribe. Hey, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Beat. Sex wasn't designed to work outside of marriage. And from what I've seen, it doesn't work very well. There's deception takes place because the couple has to find a place to have the sex in the first place. They have to keep it quiet. They do everything in their power to hide it. Instead of bringing fulfillment that God created sex to produce, it will bring temporary pleasure and then long-term destruction, and heartache. Look around, my friend. I'm in a position where I see this all the time. Broken hearts. You thought he was going to stay, didn't you? But why not give in to him? Guilt. Fear, 
and children without a mother or father. Not to say what it does to the parents who watch their son or daughter in such a situation or the grandparents. It becomes very awkward at Thanksgiving time or Christmas. They come to the house to stay, so what do you do? Let them sleep in the same bed? The price that has to be paid destroys people's lives. Don't lust for her beauty, Proverbs says. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. For a prostitute will bring you to poverty, but sleeping with another man's wife will cost your life. How many times have I seen that? Older people, younger people, doesn't seem to matter. I've seen marriages break up that were together for 50 years because of this. And then the kids are upset and turn against the dad or turn against the mother. It's just a terrible family situation. And the institution, you know, talking about the institution of the family, the basic government of society is destroyed. That's why we have so much weakness in this country. Families are not together. They're not together. The kids see their dad once a week, maybe, or they see their mother once a week. Go figure how the kid's going to feel at school. Go figure how he's going to be able to give attention to what the teacher's saying when his mind's caught up in this brokenness that's taken place in his life. Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Interesting metaphor, right? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with a man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished, but the man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. Jesus condemned the lust of adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, during Jesus' day, the Jews that would have heard this, do not commit adultery, would have yawned at it. Because they were taught from a young child all the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the, uh, the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. They knew those by heart. So as a child, I learned those, did you? We should teach them to our children. This is what God wants us to do. Just take them out in Exodus 20 and show them. So these are the things God does not want us to do. And if those things were obeyed, what an orderly, peaceful society we would have. Not the murders that we hear continually on TV happening all around us. Adultery caused by lust of the heart was foreign to them, to the Jews that heard it. You see, they went by the letter of the law. It says, do not commit adultery. That's a physical act. I don't commit adultery. What takes place inside here doesn't matter. That was the Jewish mindset. Jesus said, no, it goes beyond that. He said the root of adultery takes place in the heart or in the mind. That's also a sin. See, he, Jesus was always in the teaching mode of making people feel uncomfortable who felt comfortable with their self-righteousness. By the way, that's a preacher's job too, to make the comfortable feel uncomfortable. So the Jewish saying was, look, but don't touch. 
Jesus went to the root, as I said, of the problem. When he made adultery, not only a sin that takes place in a bed, but also a sin visualized in the mind, in the head. A lustful look is not a mere glance. You can't help but see what's in front of you. But you can help the second look. Jesus said that the problem with lust is not the sight for men of a beautiful woman or for women, a good-looking man, but the stare. Don Carson said lust is not the normal attraction which exists between men and women. There has to be an attraction or we wouldn't be here. My dad was attracted to my mother when they were in a factory just before he went into the army in World War II. So it was attraction. A normal attraction. But lust, deep-seated lust, which consumes and devours, which in imagination attacks and rapes, which mentally contemplates and commits adultery, Sin is not merely a matter of actions and of deeds. It is something within the heart that leads to action. That's why so many men are addicted to pornography in our country today. Committing the sin in the heart every time they turn the page. After a while, it becomes such an addiction, they need help with it. They need counseling to get beyond it. In fact, in the United Brethren Church, there's a group of Christian pastors that have started a therapy for pastors who are hooked on pornography. And if a pastor would call the United Brethren headquarters and said he had a problem, they'd hook him up with that counseling session and he could go online and be counseled for a period of nine months. The fact is that every one of us have broken the seventh commandment. in our imaginations, even as we have other commandments. That's why we need to understand that sexual impurity is not merely external. It's not just a physical act, but it is internal, and we need to work on it. Job said this, If my heart has been seduced by a woman, or if I have lusted for my neighbor's wife, then let my wife serve another man. In other words, let me be beaten by this, by by letting her sleep with men, other men. For lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. Now, in our society today, that would go in one ear and out the other of people. Because we sit in front of television sets every day And lust could be promoted by what we see or hear. There's a story of two Christian monks. They're walking in a complete downpour of rain. They come to a river that's swollen. They see a young Japanese woman there dressed in a kimono. These are monks. They live in a monastery. The one monk said to the young woman, can I help you? She said, I have to get across this river, but I'm afraid I'll be swept away. The monk said, look, I'll put you on my shoulders and I will carry you across the river, which he did. Back at the monastery, the other monk said, I have a bone to pick with you. He said, we're Christians, we're monks. 
we're told not to lust after a woman. We're, not, we're even told not to touch a woman. And the monk looked at his friend and he said, you know what? I carried that woman across that river. I set her down on the other side. But you're still carrying her in your mind. There, the seductive lure of adultery can be conquered. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be cast into hell. Jesus obviously did not mean that you take this literally. If he did, many of us would be blind and crippled. He was saying you better give up anything. Anything you have to give protection to your heart, to your body, to your soul, to your purity. The Lord is not asking us to cripple ourselves, but to control ourselves. If a man has trouble in this area, it's possible he'll have trouble in many other areas too. He lacks control. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this classic book written by John Bunyan in the 1600s while he was in prison. He was a Protestant minister that Bloody Mary, the Catholic Protestants, were ousted, and he was put in prison. He wrote the book, Pilgrim's Progress, while in prison. It's an interesting book if you find the updated version because the old English of this would be difficult for people to understand today. However, it's the story of a Christian who's called Christian in the book who leaves the house with this tremendous burden on his back and he goes through all these obstacles on his way to the heavenly city. He finally comes in contact with an evangelist. He shows him where the cross is and the picture in the book that you have for children, of course, is that when he gets to the cross, he falls on his knees, and this heavily burden that's been strapped to his back is cut away and rolls down the hill. Beautiful picture. Beautiful story. This book was read as much as the Bible in England at that time. But he wrote another book that's not as well known, but just as good. It's called The Holy War. And in this book, he has a city named Mansoul which is a metaphor for a human being. Mansoul is a believer ruled by Prince Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. You see that he's fighting, don't you? Because being a Christian is a battle. It's a battle between the spirit and the flesh, a battle between the spirit and the world's values outside you a battle between yourself and God. Man's soul's in a conflict with another character in the book named Diabolus, which is the devil. There's conflict throughout this book called the Holy War as the spiritual nature wars with the sinful nature within us, within man's soul's life. It's of tremendous importance that you and I understand the Christian's war with lust. I understand it. You understand it, too. It's part of our nature. It can easily control and gain control of our lives. 
Bunyan lays great emphasis on the gates of the city of Mansoul. What are the gates of the city of this Christian called Mansoul? As you read through the book, you find out that the gates of the city are the eye gate and the ear gate. which are all the ways in which the body can bring information into it. Through our eyes, through what we hear, through what we see. What kind of books do you read? What kind of shows do you watch? If Jesus was sitting right beside you, would he be pleased? He's in you. Would he be pleased? The eye gate, the ear gate. It's where kids get their information. If you're a parent and you have children, I would guard them from the television. There'd be only certain shows they'd watch. I don't want them to be corrupted too early. That'll take place in school by other children. They'll show up at your dinner table some night and use the F word. Then you'll have a little talk. We're meant for better things. The application of your life and mine is whether we keep the eye gate and ear gate closed to sinful lust. Perhaps some of you remember Homer's epic poem, uh, the Greek poem called The Odyssey, The Iliad and the Odyssey. Historical epics. Well, in The Odyssey, there's a story. The story has something to do with this picture. And Odysseus is on a ship. He's the captain of a ship. This ship has to pass an island where there are human beings and birds. I mean, it's a combination. It's a half woman and half bird. (laughs) They sing a a seductive song. They're trying to lure the sailors away from the ship onto the island. Odysseus, the captain, knows this. He knows when he goes past this island, he's got to do something to keep his men on the ship. It's so, so seductive. So he has the men fill their ears with wax so they can't hear the seductive song. Not only that, he has them wrap their heads, as you can see, with cloth so they can't hear the seductive song. Not only that, he has the men tie him to the main post, the mast of the ship. The application is clear. You must tie yourself to the mast of the cross if you're to win the battle against seduction. You cannot avoid all temptation. You will be tempted for the rest of your life. Martin Luther said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head. But you can keep them from building a nest on your head by your contemplation, by what you see by what you hear. How will you win what is every person's battle? We cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It takes a commitment on your part, men. It takes a commitment on your part, women, to bring every thought into captivity 
and to keep those thoughts from entering your mind, if at all possible. It's in the early beginnings when those thoughts start to charge your brain that you must take them to Christ and say, this is not the way Christ thinks. And give yourself to other things. Do you have trouble with the gates of your eyes, with your ears? I know myself, we'll receive magazines at home. My wife, of course, buys most of her Christmas presents through magazines. When you do that, they, of course, sell your address to every supplier of those kinds of things. There is not a day, I mean there's not a day, there's not a magazine in our mailbox, or five of them especially when spring comes, winter comes, and so on. Those magazines sometimes have women that are half-dressed in them, right? They're selling bras or whatever. They're selling of women's clothing. And I know myself, if I sit down and I start looking at magazines, and I made a commitment with my eyes, I throw it away immediately. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. You can't allow yourself to entertain yourself with that kind of material or else you're lost at that point. And the devil has won his battle with you on lust. So it's the very beginning that lust starts to charge the chemical reaction in your brain that starts to turn you on sexually that you must stop it or you know what the result is. Bring into captivity those thoughts. How do you stop it? Bring into captivity. Take them to Christ and say, Lord, help me be faithful in my marriage. Help me to be faithful to sexual purity in my life. Put the handcuffs on it. The reason you have problems containing the wrong thoughts or entertaining the wrong thoughts is because you keep feeding it. You keep feeding it. What happens if you sat at the table and fed yourself every day? You're going to be fat. Same way with lust. Keep feeding it, you get fat with lust. Why do you guard your heart? You don't want to weaken the power of the Holy Spirit because this is more men than women, I would say, have problems with this. If you don't guard your heart, you're going to be a weak Christian. You won't feel like witnessing to people because you're carrying this guilt around or you, you're just weak and the spirit in you is just weak. It, it has no desire to want to witness to people. I share this with you again, and, I'm, and I say this because I have made that commitment to witness. I was, I was in Lowe's yesterday, <laughs> and uh, there's a young man named Elliot was a cashier, 18 years old. I said, Elliot, I want, I want to ask you a question, and I asked the question, if you died, you think you'd go to heaven? And he said, I hope so. I said, but you don't know, do you, Elliot? He said, no, I don't know. I said, would you like to know? He said, yeah. I said, well, there's no other customers behind me. Do you mind if I show you this booklet? I went through the whole booklet. I got to the part where it said, are you on this side of the cross as a sinner, or are you over here with God in communication with him? He said, I'm a sinner. I said, would you like to be over here with God? He said, yes. I said, here's a prayer in the back of this booklet. Read it. I thought he'd read it to himself. He read it out loud. And he thanked me profusely. God bless Elliot. 
I hope he follows up because I took time to go to the back of the page and said, now you need to read your Bible, you need to go to church, you need to witness, you need to do all these things if you're going to keep connection with God because you're going to be in a world that has many obstacles to you being that. And so for us, there's many obstacles for us being what God wants us to be. We only have a short time left. So what are you going to do with it? You going to spend your time lusting? Thomas Kempis said, resist beginnings. And I've said that to you probably several times in my presentation today. At the very beginning, at the very root of these things happening in your mind, stop it. Now, perhaps you've been caught in the web of sinful thoughts and sinful actions. But I want you to know, come to Christ, my friend. He offers forgiveness. He offers grace. Unabounding, unabounding love for you. Confess your sin to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. You had better things for me than this. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. I was forgiven. Many of you have been forgiven. Some of you feel maybe you need to be forgiven. And so the altar's open today. I would have you come and share a prayer with me and put it behind you. Make that commitment. I'm going to be what God wants me to be in a sexual way. The kind of attitudes I carry about my sexual self. So as we sing this song, you come. If the Lord speaks to your heart. We're singing as we stand. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up. Is he talking to you today? Do you need to come and you need to confess? It's a good time. It's a good time. Like the woman at How many of you felt God speaking to you during this sermon today? Just raise your up hand. I see that. I see many hands. I don't know why any everybody would not raise their hand on this sermon today. And I want to pray for you that God will help you make a commitment with your eyes. God, I'm asking you today to help these folks develop a steel spine spiritually. That in this world where all these things are being seen on a regular basis, we know our weaknesses of the flesh. We know that we are attracted sometimes to the point of lust. And that sin then enters our minds and hearts. So God, we ask you to forgive us and make us whole. Just like the song says, fill our cup so that it overflows and floods away all the things of this life that break a connection with you. We want to be happy people, and happiness is not found in the other way. It, it isn't. It only becomes a desperate situation. So we ask for your blessing as we sing this last verse together, shall we?
Now may the grace of Christ, may the forgiveness of Christ, may the boldness of Christ, may the courage of Christ, may the self-control of the Holy Spirit be what we are. God, we just need you so much to empower us to fight the battle that we fight in this world to be the kind of people that you meant for us to be. So God, give us a joy, uh, a complete makeover, so that we become the person like Christ in so many ways, though we never will be perfect. We just pray, God, that we rise higher. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, folks. We enjoyed having you here today.